Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. That's better. That's better. I want to be sure everybody is uh, paying attention. Now, did you ever find yourself in a situation where you were probably full of doubts, or you had too many options to choose, or you just not sure, you were not sure what to do? Did you ever needed someone to tell you clear, clearly what to do? Yes or no? Yeah? I found myself a lot in that situation. Every time we must make decisions or we face challenges in our lives, it's kind of a multiple options test. Uh, you can choose A or you can choose B, but sometimes there it's a C, D, E, and so on and on and on. We have to decide, but many times we do, know, we do not know what. Like finishing school, what college should I go? Choosing a job, where should I go? Starting dating, what should I do? Or even better, what I shouldn't do? Uh, how should I manage my time with school, with studying, with working and doing the chores, and also balancing spiritual life? Uh, some of you will look at your mom, uh, will look at your dad, or you look at your coach, or for some of you guys that are smart, you look at your wife and it's like, tell me what to do. Um, think about it. How nice would it be if you woke up in the morning and there will be someone in your house? Actually, that would be creepy. <laughs> But imagine being there, someone that will tell you what to do. Hey, here is what you need to wear to work based on the weather today. Hey, this is what you should eat for breakfast to be sure you have enough energy for today. Uh, when you go to work, it will be so nice to be someone there telling you, hey, you should take care of those emails first and ignore the others, or so on and on and on. Um, or for you ladies, wouldn't, wouldn't it be so nice to be someone there that will tell you, like, hey, here, you can make this dinner in 15 minutes, and by the way, everybody will love it in the house. Um, that will be so nice. Now, this is what I know about most of us. In life, we want to get it right. We are scared of getting it wrong, but we are not always sure what right is. Should I take the job or should I not take the job? Where should I go to college? And if you are a Christian, on top of that, you are mixing God. What does God want, what does God want me to do? Uh, what does he want me not to do? So we want to get it right. We are scared to get it wrong, but not sure what right is. So for this reason, the title of my message today is, Tell Me What to Do, God. And before we go in the message, let's pray. Heavenly Father, in today's world, we're facing so many decisions. We're facing so many circumstances. We're facing so many situations that we have to make a decision. And many times, we don't know what that decision should be. So we are asking for you to just inspire us, empower us, to help us to have a sensitive ear to listen to what you want us for each one of, for each one of us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So today we continue our message uh, series called Think Ahead. As we look at decisions that we can pre-decide today, instead of waiting for when uh, we will be in the moment. Today, we are looking at a man from the Old Testament, and probably everybody knows about him. Uh, his name is Abraham. And see how he actually predecided to obey God. And we'll learn how we can predecide today to obey God tomorrow. We'll be in Genesis chapter 22. 
and if you have your Bible with you, or if you have your version app on your devices, you can just follow up. I'm not going to read a lot of Bible verses, but I really encourage you, go back home and read the story of Abraham. Actually, the story of Abraham uh, is not just in chapter 22. It's starting all the way in chapter 12 or even earlier. So, but we are looking at uh, Genesis chapter 22. It's actually the climax of uh, Abraham's story. So, 22 verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. That makes me already uneasy. Testing is an event that outwardly exposes an inward reality. It shows on the outside what is actually happening on the inside. In other words, uh, in my opinion, God is saying, okay, let's squeeze him, let's squeeze Abraham and see what's coming out. I don't know if you have been tested by God. I'm not sure if I have been tested by God, but this I know. We all feel or we all felt that kind of squeezed sometimes in our life. Might be uh, uh, medical uh, uh, struggles, might be financial struggle, and so or relational struggle, and so on and on. So we all know how it feels to be squeezed as life closes in. So um, God tested Abraham, and Abraham said, "Here I am." He replied. Three words in English. But actually, it's only one word in Hebrew, a very important uh, word in Hebrew. And actually, this here I am, it's Hanini. <clears throat> this word actually shows up 17 times, only 17 times in the Old Testament. When God called Moses from the burning bush, Moses replied, Hanini. <clears throat> when God uh, called Joseph... Um, Joseph replied, Hanini. When God called Samuel, and Samuel wasn't sure what's happening, he was instructed by an older prophet to, to answer, Hanini. <clears throat> but Hanini, here I am, it's more than just location. In school, I took uh, uh, two years of French, and I can remember maybe ten words. One is oui, one is non, one is voila, and probably uh, présent. And every time, uh, most of the time actually, uh, the teacher will take attendance at the beginning of the class. And everyone will answer présent. And they will start answering, and then uh, the teacher will be Catalin, and no one answered, because I was playing games, or my mind was 100 miles away, and then all the other students was pointing at me, and then I could hear the teacher, voila, Catalin, and I'll say, prison, prison, I'm here, but my mind literally was 100 miles away. So Hanini, it's more than just here I am present. Uh, Hanini means more like, here I am available. So when Abraham said Hanini, he said not just I'm here, present. He said, here I am available. Abraham said, here I am, Lord, ready to serve. Tell me what to do. We want to get it right. We are scared to get it wrong. But sometimes we just don't know what right is. So, somewhere in the first 40 years of following God, from roughly chapter 12 in Genesis to chapter 22, uh, in those 40 years of following God, Abraham learned that his greatest ability was actually his availability. Your greatest ability is your availability. Abraham predecided, God, I am going to obey. Now, what is the question or what is the task? See, obedience leads you towards God. Disobedience drives you away 
from God. Abraham said, Hanini, here I am available. What is the task? I want you to take, and God answered, I want you to take your son, Isaac. I want you to go to the land of Moriah. I want you to climb the mountain. I want you to build an altar, put some wood on it, and sacrifice your son, Isaac. So the Bible said, the next day, Abraham woke up, loaded the donkey with some wood, took Isaac, and started the journey. He got to the mountain, he built the altar, placed Isaac on the altar, and, she wa and he was getting ready to sacrifice Isaac. When a voice from heaven said to Abraham, 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 don't hurt the boy. You did pass the test. Now I know that you honor me more than anything else. I read this story many, many times. And first thing that always gets my attention is that God spoke to Abraham with an audible voice and told him what he wants him to do. Man, that would be so easy. I never had that happen to me. I like to think that if God will do that to me, for me, of course I will listen to him. And many of you are in the same boat. I ask many people, do you want to do what God wants you to do? And I never heard anyone saying, mm, no, thank you. So, everyone wants to do what God wants them to do. The follow-up question, though, is what does God want you to do? Do you know the answer number one I get when I ask that question? I'm not sure. And the number two answer I get when I ask that question is, I want to do the right thing. And then, of course, I follow up with a question. What is the right thing? I'm not sure. I don't know. I want to do the right thing. I'm scared of doing the wrong thing, but I'm not sure what the right thing is. Here is what I want to do today. I want to take a little detour uh, for a few minutes, and I want to talk about how do we know. If we are a follower of Christ, how do we know God, what God wants us to do? So let me tell you this. Sometimes God directs us clearly. The Word of God says this uh, through Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be truly equipped for every good work. The Bible is the Word of God inspired, alive, and active. Sometimes we open it, we read it, and God is directing us what to do. Like, love God, love your neighbors. God says, I want you to forgive one another. I want you to love your enemy. I want you to seek justice. I want you to care for people that cannot care for themselves. Many times we just hear the word, but God wants us to be doer of the word. With other words, do what he's asking us to do. Because if not, without realizing, we become like other people that uh, Jesus talked about in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 6, where Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Doesn't make any sense. So, sometimes God directs us clearly. But sometimes God guides us quietly. Think about it. Romans 8 said this, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. If you are a follower of Christ, if you are part of God's family, the Holy Spirit is in you. 
One of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to guide us. It's like when you are in prayer and you hear that small voice in your mind uh, and think that maybe that could be God telling you something. It's like when you are worshiping and you feel God's presence and you feel like, I think God is here. I think God is telling me something. Or maybe it's like when you are in a small group and the discussion is going on and on and on and somebody starts sharing about something that you just read the day before. It's possible to be God speaking. And question will be, how do I know that actually it's God speaking? Well, first rule is that you have to take what you heard back to the word of God. Because anything and everything has to align with the word of God. If it doesn't align with the word of God, then it's not from God. So sometimes God directs us clearly. Sometimes God guides us quietly. And sometimes God grows us silently. The story. I want to just tell you uh, in just a few minutes the story of uh, how we actually planted Influence Church. See, we'll go back. I was 13 years old, and I grew up with my grandma Christian, and she was taking me every Sunday to church. Uh, when she couldn't go to church, actually uh, was embedded in me, so I was going to church. Actually, at 10, 11, 12, I was taking two buses and go to church by myself. I learned that at 9 o'clock I'm in church, until 12 o'clock, every Sunday morning. 9 o'clock, I was first in. 12 o'clock, I was first out. And I thought, hey, I put my time in with God Sunday morning. I will be blessed the whole week. And without realizing, I developed this ritual, if you want to call it. And I became kind of religious. I developed this religious spirit, that thinking like, that's all I need. Be in church at 9 o'clock, stay until 12 o'clock, which sometimes was the longest three hours in my life. And then thank you. God for just an hour, an hour and 15 minute services. So without realizing, I developed this spirit. But before I turned 14, actually, I realized God has more in store for me. So before I turned 14, actually, I gave my life to Christ. And it's like, I want a relation with God. I just, I don't just want, I just don't want to put my time in. It's more to that. Uh, it's more to God than this. So uh, before I turned 14, uh, I really committed my life to Christ. And then I was baptized in water. And then just a few months later, uh, we had the Romanian Revolution, which was a very bloody revolution with tanks and army and shootings and streets and all that stuff. And then I realized how important life is. I was 14 years old and I realized I could have died right there. I could die right here, right now. Where am I going? Am I going to spend the eternity with God or not? And it's not just that. At 14 years old, I realized, what about all the other friends that I have? What about all the other people that we were in the uh, square and we were just demonstrating and we can, could hear guns and uh, uh, shootings and tanks on the street and think like, if my friend is dying, where is he going to go? So at that moment, I start being involved with the youth ministry. A couple years later, we start uh, uh, our young adult group, and we start planting churches in, uh, around the capital, small villages, uh, churches. And around 18, 19 years old, I made this decision. Hey, I'm going to work really hard while I was involved in the ministry, and then I'm going to take over 20, 30% of my income, I'm going to invest it that at age 45, I will be able to just work for a church, not get paid because churches at that time in Romania would not pay a pastor. So I say like, I will invest, I will have money, I will retire from the, social, from the secular job, and then I will just work for God. So I had a plan. I forgot to check it with God. And he decided to mess it up. <laughs> Probably you've been there too. I'm not the only one. So, um, God decided to bring me to the United States. Like, oh, great. I barely speak English. I still barely speak English, as you can see. Uh, I got a little better, but 
sometimes I think we should have a sign, one of those signs that we have up front saying, uh, please, um, sorry for our mess, we are under construction as a church. Because we are. So God decided to bring me to uh, United States, which not very good English, complete different culture, and not knowing my future at all. I was like, God, I thought we have a deal. I thought we put together a plan. And then I realized it was not God's plan. So, in 2003, uh, I got uh, to United States. Uh, 2004, I got married. Uh, 2005, we got the first kid. And 2007, we got another kid. 2010, we bought a house. And my savings started going down. My wife wanted to go on vacations. My savings really went down. And I was like, what's going on? I thought we have a deal. I thought we have a plan. I better not talk too much about Kelly's uh, vacation plan because I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> but, <coughs> 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 so, I thought, no, it's not God's plan anymore. But, God placed me in another church and I thought, I'm doing pretty good. I was, do I was doing finances, I was doing uh, legal stuff, I was doing... <coughs> Uh, some of the uh, counseling, marriage counseling, and so on and on. And then uh, uh, I thought, like, well, this is what God wants me to do. Well, fast forward a couple of years, a few years, uh, 2020 happened. We moved to Hanover, and without realizing, with Kelly and I, uh, one day, uh, start having this desire to start a church because we love Hanover, and we know that God placed us in Hanover for a reason. So we both look at each other, and she said, I said it. Uh, I don't remember saying it, but she said, I said, we should start a church. Without realizing, actually, we did start a, a church. And we start thinking and planting the church, and that was in 2020. And not even realizing, actually, until a year later, that actually in 2020, I turned 45. Like, whoa, my mind was not at that plan at all anymore. So, sometimes God directs us clearly, sometimes He guides us quietly, and also sometimes He grows us silently, which drives me insane. Because I don't know if you realize, but growing has growing pains. It's no fun growing. So, when you find yourself grown silently by God, you'll actually find yourself surrounded by good company. Abraham followed God for 40 years until this moment, Genesis 22, the moment for the test. Pastor Craig Rochelle said that, based on uh, uh, some research, that average human being makes 35,000 decisions every day. 35,000 decisions a day, times 365 days in a year, times 40 years. Let me do a quick general math, and that means Abraham, in the 40 years, made probably over 500 million decisions. Do you know how many times God spoke to Abraham that is recorded in the scripture audible? Seven times. Think about it. Out of 511 million times of the, de the decision, God directed him clearly only seven times. But 511 million minus the seven, God guided Abraham quietly and grew him silently. Let's look at Jesus. Jesus, if you study the New Testament, Jesus was asked 183 questions in the Bible. Do you know how many out of 183 he answered directly? Three. Very important three, but he answered directly only three questions. 180 times he answered with questions of his own. He answered with stories. Sometimes clear, sometimes not too clear. 
And sometimes Jesus did not answer at all. Was he being unkind? Was he playing a, ga playing a game? Or was he doing something bigger? God wants us to be Christ-like person. Well, that means making decision like Christ. God's ultimate goal is not just information for us to what to do, what not to do. It's about transformation for me and you to become more like Christ and to make decisions just like Christ. So, back to the uh, planting the uh, church. Kelly and I look at each other feeling that God is calling us to start Influence Church. And look at each other, we both said, now what? We started praying. Of course, we couldn't tell anyone because it was our desire, and we we're not sure is this God or is not God. We couldn't share with anyone, but without realizing, God brought the right company around us to be able to fulfill uh, his plan. So, back to sometimes God direct us clearly. Sometimes God guide us quietly, and sometimes God grows us silently. Which sometimes drives me insane. Can I be honest with you? I'm a number guy. So, when we start thinking about planting a church, I told God from the beginning, Lord, you give me the money, I will start the church. Right? Makes sense. And then I wrestled this with God for weeks, if not months. And I could hear God in my mind saying, like, no, no, this is not how we do business. You start the church and I will give you the money. And then I went back, no, this is not how I do. And one day I went to the mailbox and then I uh, opened a letter from a dear friend of ours. And in that envelope was also a check for $10,000 to start the church. We received the first money from somebody that not even supposed to know that we are planning, planting to, uh, desiring to start the church. Through a mix directing us clearly, guiding us quietly, and growing us silently, God got us where we are today. But please, please understand, be patient with us. He's not done with us yet. So we are growing, and when we are growing, we make messes. And sometimes growing, you can think about growing like a 14, 15, 18, 20 years old. Well, we are growing like a two and a three years old. <laughs> I hope you get my memo. <laughs> I think God wants to bring us to a place where he can trust us to let us choose. And that is a frightening In Abraham's story, we see that Abraham trusted God. He had faith in God. But also, God trusted Abraham. Think about it. God had faith in Abraham. God could have chosen anyone to start his people, but he chose Abraham. God said, I want that one. I put inside of him what I need to fulfill my plan. The same, God is looking to each one of us and says, I have faith in you. I trusted you with this child if you have children. I trusted you with this job if you have a job. I trusted you with these friends, if you have any friends, hopefully. I trusted you with being in this church, if you are part of this church, or I trusted you with being in any part or in any other church, if you are part of any other churches. It's always that God is trusting us with what we have. As we need to put our faith in God, God places his faith in us. But it's the same dilemma. I want to get it right I am scared to get it wrong, but I don't always know what right is. The truth is that God does speak to us. Genesis chapter 22 is 
a troubling uh, uh, story. It's a troubling chapter. God decided to taste Abraham, to shake him to his core, to squeeze him and see what comes out, to see what kind of a man he is. If you grew up in church, possible to just lose some of the emotions attached to his to this story. So I want to tell again the story. But this time, I want all of us to try to feel what Abraham felt. So God called Abraham. 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 And Abraham said, Hanini, here I am available. And then God says, Abraham, I want you to take your only son, the one that you waited for 15 years, the one that you prayed for 15 years. I want you to take Isaac and go to the land of Moriah. Climb the mountain that you climbed before. But this time, I want you, Abraham, to sacrifice your only son, Isaac. So, early next morning, Abraham wakes up. He loads the donkey with the wood for the altar. He, I, he Isaac, and two servants um, began to do what he did probably every year for 40 years. Began to walk where God told him to go. So, they walked for three days. By the way, the trip doesn't take three days. He took three days, giving God every opportunity to intervene, to change his mind, to make it stop. So they walk for three days. After three days, they get to the bottom of this Mount Moriah. They leave behind the donkey and the servant, servants. So Isaac... It's picking up the wood and start following his father, Abraham, on the mountain. <coughs> Can you imagine Abraham getting to the uh, top of the mountain and start setting up the stones for the altars? One by one by one, he's setting up the stones. As he was thinking, on this altar, I will sacrifice my only son. After the altar is put together, he takes the wood put the wood, but I forgot to say, before they even got to put, put together the altar, before they even climbed to the mountain, actually Isaac has a question for his dad. Isaac said, Dad, Father, and Abraham actually answered, Hanini, because Abraham was not just available to God, he was also available to people. And Isaac said, I see the wood, I see the fire, but where is the lamb? The word that probably Abraham didn't want to hear. And Abraham replies, God will provide. So as Abraham was building the altar, put the wood on the altar, and bound, bound Isaac, he placed him on the altar, and as he was reaching for the knife, he hears a voice saying, Abraham, Abraham, don't hurt the boy. You passed the test. I tested you to the core, and you passed. How does Abraham obey a God who asked him to sacrifice his son? How do we obey a God who allows so many troubling things to happen in our world? How do we obey a God that sometimes asks us to do things that we do not want to do? We obey Him because this is not something that He only asks us to do. This is something that He did. A few hundred years later, we see this story in the New Testament, where the Son of God was sacrificed for us to be able to be reconciled with God the Father. God in heaven called his son, hey, 
Jesus. And Jesus replied, Hanini, here I am, available, willing to sacrifice to save what was lost. Because of his sacrifice, we have access to God. He is not, actually, our God is not just looking for people who are available. He is a God that is available. He made all of this possible. Isaiah chapter 58 verse 9 says this. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will answer. Hanini, here I am available. See, in the end of the story of Abraham, God provided a substitute. A ram was there on the mountain, and actually Abraham used that as a sacrifice. But for Jesus, actually, was no substitute. And do you know why? Because he was a substitute for you and I. For us to have eternal life, for us to experience God's love and mercy. I want to get it right. I am scared to get it wrong. But I don't always know what right is. But this is what I do know. I know who is asking me to follow him. Even when we do not see good in our circumstances, God is good. Even when we don't see where he is taking us, we can see who he is. A loving, merciful father. The question for us is, will we answer Hanini when he calls our names? When he's going to say your name, when you hear your name called by God, will you, will I answer Hanini? Not just present, not just present. Hanini, here I am, available. I'm not sure about you, but my prayer for me, for my family, for my wife, for my kids, is that we will answer Hanini, here I am. Am. Because as Joshua said, as for me and my house, we want to serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. If I can have everyone please uh, stand up. I want to end this message in prayer. And I want us to just be able to allow God to strengthen us, to empower us, to be able to uh, remember We all want to get it right. We are scared to get it wrong. And many times we don't know what right is. We have to allow God to direct us clearly, to guide us quietly, and also to grow us silently. If you never gave your life to Christ, I want to give you that opportunity right here, right now. To make that commitment. Maybe you try doing life on your own. Many times, many ways, different ways. And each time you failed. Give God one try. You will not be disappointed. If I can have everyone please close your eyes. This is just between you and God. But if you never gave your life to Christ. Or maybe you gave your life to Christ a long time ago. And something happened. Life just happened. And you are not in the same relation with God. You can just rededicate your life to Christ. And if you want to give your life to Christ. Or rededicate your life to Christ. Just raise your hand. Just let God know. That you are ready to say. Hanini. Here I am. Available. Heavenly Father, if you said, if you are here in this room or watch this message online, all you have to do is say this prayer with me. Father, I try my own ways so many times and I failed so many times. Today, I'm going to try your way. I give my life to you. Today, I'm saying 
Hanini, here I am, available. I give my life to you. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. That all you had to do. If you say that prayer with me, if you give your life or rededicate your life to Christ, I want you to just reach out to us because we have a book that we want to give you that is going to help you uh, in your walk with God. It's called What's Next. It's a great book that is going to help you how to pray, how to uh, worship, uh, uh, the importance of church, and so on and on and on. Now for all of us that probably we walk with God, we've been walking with God for a long time. But still, but still, we just said present. We never said Hanini. I want us. I want, I will pray. And if you are at that place, just say the word Hanini to God. You don't have to yell it out loud. It's just whispering to him. You will put a smile on his face. Heavenly Father, here we are, available. Your ways are better than our ways. Your plans are better than our plans. So we are asking for you to help us trust in you with everything and anything in our lives. With the sickness that we might face, with the finances that we might not have, with the relations that are broken, with anything and everything that is not how supposed to be in our life, we are trusting in you. And we are asking for you to help us follow your plan. We are asking for you to whisper to each one of us and follow your plans because we know the plans that we, you have for us to have a future, to prosper, and to grow in our relation with you. So, here we are saying, Hanini, here we are available.